Good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to welcome you all to the LSE this evening, which is a particularly interesting evening, I'm sure, for a number of you. Um, can I just introduce myself? My name is Kate Jenkins. I was vice chair of the school for a number of years, and I'm a visiting professor in the government department, so I stand between the administration and the academics within the school. Um, very exciting evening. We're glad to have Sophie here. Um, and as I'm sure you will all know, um, Sophie Walker is the candidate in the mayoral election for the Women's Equality Party. Um, Sophie's been a journalist for a number of years and she also works closely with the um, National Autism Society, um, working particularly on the problems of women and girls suffering from autism. I think it's a very interesting balance of interests that she has. Um, before we begin the formal proceedings, I have to run through some housekeeping. You have the hashtag up there, which I hope those of you who want to use it will use, but I've been told to ask you if you would please keep your telephone <coughs> tones switched off, even though you need to have it on, I know, to use the hashtag. Um, secondly, fire exits. There's one over there and there's one over there and um, they no longer say fire but I'm assured that those are the fire exits. And there are um, stewards here who will direct you should we have a fire which we certainly don't expect to do. Um, I, the order of running I think will be simply that Sophie will speak first and then we'll have question and answer and I hope we've got quite a long time for that because I expect there will be a number of questions um, and there's a sort of fairly careful procedure for doing that so that we can handle the questions well which I will go into later but for the moment I think I'd just simply like to introduce Sophie thank her very much for coming and hand over to you thank, thank you, you. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, the title of this uh, address is called Why Equality is Better for Everyone. Um, I think I say that about ten times a day now and I never get bored of saying it. Two months ago I gave a speech in which I said that it felt as though we were on the edge of something extraordinary. We were launching our campaign for elections on May the 5th so that for the first time in British history voters would have the chance to put women's equality at the top of the political agenda. When you go to the ballot box a week on Thursday you will all have the opportunity to vote for a party that has as its beating heart the needs and experiences of women. But in fact, the extraordinary started happening much sooner than I anticipated. <laughs> it's already happening. We have seen that we did not have to wait until election day and that just by being in the political space, we are making change and we are changing the conversation. Recently, Sadiq Khan said that a vote for him we put a proud feminist in City Hall. Zach Goldsmith has said that tackling violence against women and girls will be a defining issue of his mayoralty. This is what happens when we are in the race. Women's equality has been elevated from a political footnote to a badge of honour, with each candidate claiming it as their own. And that was precisely our intention. The Women's Equality Party was created a year ago by Sandy Toxvig and Catherine Mayer, following another general election in which women were all but forgotten until pollsters established that we might hold the margin of victory. And many of us realised that if we wanted to see change, we had to get out there and be it. We had to become a political force. Just as the Greens and UKIP have shown, the currency of votes has a power in it. But we wanted to do things differently and we knew that our success relied on us building as broad a movement as possible. And that rather than dividing to conquer, we needed to unite. So we decided to build a non-partisan political party. I think that's a first. 
challenging the idea of tribal politics, we opened our doors to people from across the political spectrum. Because women's equality is not a single issue, and women are not a special interest group. And because we needed to exert pressure on all the political parties to make a lasting change. Unlike the Greens and UKIP, however, we have been asked about our name. Why did we call ourselves the Women's Equality Party? Individuals wonder if this means that they are not welcome. Groups have questioned why we aren't just the Equality Party. The media has categorised us as niche. We were surprised by such queries. Sandy has developed a response that is simply, well, we thought we'd be clear. But as time has passed, I've come to see how important this question is and how it is at the heart of everything that we are trying to do. When we developed our London Manifesto for Transport, we looked at the issue of accessibility. And in examining the prized Routemaster bus, we realised that in fact it was a metaphor for our campaign. On London's buses, wheelchair users and people with pushchairs are pitted against each other for a tiny amount of space. Mums with babies are left waiting in the rain as buses pass. Some wheelchair users have given up trying to use buses as a reliable means of moving around the city. And yet, until now, the idea that we might consider making enough space for both groups has simply not been considered. Equality is seen as a zero-sum game. If we give a bit of equality to this group, then it will need to be taken away from that group. One of the things I've heard so often since I started doing this is, haven't you got enough equality? <laughs> I don't know what that looks like, but my instinctive answer is always no. And our response here is to say, let's design a better bus. When we can all use the bus, the public transport system does the job it is supposed to do. People cut down on car journeys, air pollution falls. Put simply, equality is better for everyone. Let's take childcare as another example. London has the highest rates of maternal unemployment in the country. Across the country, 1% of men are using their paternity leave. The sky-high cost of childcare, combined with London's pay gap, which is the biggest anywhere in the UK, 23% as against a national average of 15%. It means that the sensible decision, in fact for many the only decision, is nearly always going to be that the woman does the caring. And increasingly that also means caring for older relatives as well as for young children. So women are dropping out of the workplace and men are dropping out of their families. It is a system that works well for no one. Let's take a closer look at what's going on in our economy. Right now our economy does not work for women and that is a problem because women make up half the population. And by barring women from the workplace, by discriminating against us, by creating occupational segregation so that the jobs we are allowed to do pay less and are held in lower regard, we are limiting our country's potential for economic growth. We are limiting the diversity of businesses. We are limiting their ability to tap a diverse range of, of talents by trapping so many women at home, unable to work. And don't just take my word for it. In a report last year, the McKinsey Global Institute found that advancing women's equality could add $12 trillion to global GDP just by 2025. And yet the old-fashioned political parties continue with their old-fashioned approach. The recent budget announcement is a case in point. In the face of a growing national debt, and economic instability, the government continues to prioritise investment in infrastructure and construction, men's jobs, while women's jobs in the public sector are seen as expenses to be cut. The result? To drive women into even greater dependency on government services and benefits. And so the circle turns. 
Meanwhile, the media continues to show us its version of this world. The media is the heart of our culture. It has a profound effect on the way that women and girls perceive themselves and perceive the world around them. In the UK, we have grown used to print and broadcast journalism that sidelines women, that sexualizes women, that is reliant on a male-centric news agenda from which women are largely excluded. We are used to watching TV content that contains a limited and limiting number of roles for women. With a sense of gallows humour, we put this list together in the office. When you say female character on TV, the first answer is usually murder victim. The next one, drunk single woman. The next one, the token BME character. The next one, the disabled character, if we're lucky. We are used to seeing sport as an arena in which women simply don't compete. We are used to fashion and beauty photography that shows women with an unhealthy BMI. And all of this, all of it, limits women. But just as importantly, it also stereotypes men in ways which hold them back. The everywhere character of the bumbling dad is just as insidiously harmful. Equality would be better for everyone. Violence against women and girls is one of the most important examples of the damage that is done by this structural inequality. For it is a structural violence that is largely perpetrated by men against women on the basis of their gender. As long as women live with the fear of violence, none of us are free. And yet the justice system's failure to understand this means that instances of harassment, abuse and violence are increasing while prosecution rates remain the same. And the government's failure to understand this means that specialist support services are being closed down in favour of gender-neutral, generic service providers. A gender-neutral approach does not deal with the perpetrator and it does not support the specific needs of the victim, whoever they may be. And a gender-neutral approach to politics inflicts the same damage. So equality is not a zero-sum game. It has the potential to transform our economy, our society and our businesses. Equality belongs to us. City Hall belongs to us. We are within our rights to lay claim to both. So that's what we're going to do. Every candidate in the London election has an economic plan. We have a plan that will create a step change in the economy. We've got the radical idea of giving London's four million women the opportunity to do the jobs they want to do by providing flexible, affordable childcare, by fighting back against discrimination. We will lead by example, making every job in the GLA flexible by default and publishing pay in City Hall with full transparency right now so that we can get a real look at what is going on inside our organisations and take action wherever they fall short so that we can encourage London's businesses via the commissioning power of the Mayor to do the same. We will make sure that part-time workers are paid at the same hourly rate as those on full-time contracts. Revolutionary! <laughs> but it doesn't happen otherwise. We will make work work. Every candidate has a line about childcare. We will build a world-class caring economy 
investing in care and valuing carers' contribution to our society. Only we have a plan to close the childcare gap between the end of paid parental leave at nine months and government-funded support at three to four, four years, because nothing is a bigger barrier to women's employment than the cost of London's childcare. We will ensure that London's boroughs meet their duty to provide care for disabled children. And we won't stop there. We will convene a commission on care so that we can truly see the scale of demand and the scale of the chronic recruitment problem for carers of older people. We will ask care providers to pay a living wage and provide quality training for a job that should be respected. We will encourage employers to provide five to ten days of paid care leave each year and a day one right to request flexible working. Good employers will also offer a period of adjustment leave because sometimes the need to care for a loved one can turn your life upside down. Every candidate has a housing plan. Boy, do they have housing plans. Only we will put more money into women's pockets right now to make rent affordable right now. And that matters because twice as many women as men in London spend half their salary on rent. And when overall, every year, women in London earn £70 billion less than men in London, they have a very different idea of what affordable housing looks like. And I want to be clear, there is no silver bullet for a housing crisis on the scale of the one that London faces right now. Any candidate who insists that only he has the answer is doing Londoners a disservice. Instead of arguing over piecemeal plans, this very old-fashioned politics, my idea is better than yours, no mine is, no mine is, no mine is, no mine is. We say let's combine the vision and scale of our collective ambition in a cross-party committee for housing action. A cross-party committee that puts the needs of all Londoners ahead of political gain. Within that, we will ring fence funds to provide homes for some of the most vulnerable people in London, the women and children fleeing domestic violence. There were 146,000 incidents of domestic violence in London last year. We must ensure places of refuge for people who are currently trapped in dangerous situations and cannot afford to leave because London can never prosper when women live with the fear of violence. Every candidate has a policing plan. Only we see that stamping out violence against women and girls has to be a priority. We talk about gang crime. We talk about knife crime. Why do we not talk about the fact that in the city where we live, 85% of young women experience harassment on our streets? Why do we not talk about the fact that every day in London, 15 rapes are recorded? Right now, I don't know if you've seen them, we have a billboard campaign that is running across London. Some of those adverts were refused because they used the word rape. We were denied the language to tell the story of London's women. We do need more police, yes. We will train a modern, diverse police force that understands survivors' experiences, that has the trust of the community, that can do policing better for everyone. We will also provide sufficient and sustainable funding for specialist support and counselling services that are for and led by women, including BME women, including disabled women so that no survivor is ever turned away. But we need more. We need to be ambitious. We need to be hopeful. We need to build a tolerant 
and respectful society. So we will teach the next generation to respect and protect each other by providing specialist sex and relationships classes in all London schools, a directive straight from City Hall. Every candidate has a plan for transport. Only we will put accessibility and safety at the top of the list. The night tube is no good if women are afraid to use it. So we will introduce a night watch service on buses, trains and tubes following the Fair Dodger model. We will improve lighting, Wi-Fi and information so that victims know how to report harassment and bystanders can stop it. We will use an inclusive design process to build better buses and accessible tube networks. We will build more cycling facilities and cycle highways so that women and children can bike around the city in the same numbers as men, in greater numbers and in safety. That kind of equality is better for everyone. Gender equality could deliver so many prizes, untapped billions in economic growth, better functioning institutions, more accessible transport, safer streets and cleaner air. But the biggest of all is a more harmonious society. Research clearly shows that more gender equal countries are better places to live. They have lower rates of depression, lower rates of divorce, higher rates of well-being. They are happier, safer places. I want that. I want that. I want London to be the first gender equal city in the world. I am campaigning hard to make that happen. But meanwhile, for the fifth election in a row, we are being told that the only people with a chance of winning are men. For the fifth time in a row, we are being told that women's opportunity and prosperity is not a big issue. For the fifth time in a row, we are being told that equality can wait. Well, I am here to say that it can't wait. I am under no illusion about the scale of the challenge, the cost of politics, and the sclerosis of the system. They make for difficult odds. You may remember that at the last election, UKIP got more than 4 million votes, it got one seat. The Greens got over 1 million votes, got one seat. The SNP got half a million votes and 56 seats. In England, this voting system enshrines the two big parties. It makes them feel they don't need to earn votes. It makes them feel that they are entitled to them. It leaves the electorate so disillusioned about the possibility of change that it stops voting. More than 9 million women and 8 million men did not vote at the last election. That's 9 million women too many and 8 million too many men. In London, in this London election, things could be different. The proportional voting system means that broad support beats geographically concentrated votes. And you know something great? I really believe we can win. But this means doing politics differently. At every step of this journey since we set up the Women's Equality Party, we have dared to ask ourselves, are we doing this this way because it's the way it should be done? Or are we doing this this way because it's the way it's always been done? We wanted to build a political movement rather than just a political party. So we crowdsourced our policies with experts and with volunteers in cafes and kitchens up and down the country. And we engaged skilled volunteers in setting up the party, creating everything from our logo to our local branches. We had to build a different kind of funding model. We don't have the multi-millionaire backers that the Conservatives have. We don't have the Labour Party's unions. So we had to be creative. We built a crowdfunding campaign called WeBay so that supporters on low incomes could sell off the things they no longer wanted to raise money for the party. Recently, artists such as the Chapman Brothers and Damien Hirst have also supported us by donating their artworks. 
We wanted to field different kinds of candidates. We wanted to attract people from all walks of life to represent the party in our first elections. So we took out the psychometric testing from the candidates' application forms. We made it an open application process. We offered bursaries to those on low incomes. We provided childcare for candidates. The result is a diverse list of inspirational women, some of whom are here, many of whom had never been involved in politics before. We wanted to build a different kind of media campaign. We don't have the media access that the other political parties do. They keep putting us on the lifestyle pages. So we had to innovate. We built campaigns on digital platforms and social media. Our We Count campaign supports women to geomap and reclaim sites and locations where they experienced unwanted sexual attention. To say that they count. To make their mark. We will make a mark. We are already making a mark. The groundswell of support we have seen since we established the party a year ago has been phenomenal. We now have around 47,000 members and registered supporters and 73 branches across the UK. When the government threatened to remove feminism from the A-level syllabus, I went directly to the Minister of Education. With all those people, some brilliant campaigners, and all of those votes behind me. The government did a U-turn, because votes matter. The day we kicked off our campaign in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon announced an expanded childcare programme because votes matter. When I attended the Women of the World mayoral hustings, I had the peculiar experience of hearing Sadiq Khan make to that audience the same speech that I had given at a previous hustings. Because votes matter. Across the country, we are seeing the old parties fighting to regain ownership of women's equality. And every time they use our lines in their manifesto speeches, every time they lift our policies for their manifestos, every time they decry violence against women in the media, we celebrate. And then we raise the bar a bit higher. On the 5th of May, there will be a place in London where we are all equal. It's the ballot box. On the 5th of May, you get four votes. You get two for the Mayor of London, and you get two for the London Assembly. We would like you to give half of your votes to equality. We think that's fair. Help us make London a place where we are all equal, every day. Thank you. Well, Sophie, thank you very much indeed. I think that was an excellent exposition of a number of tricky issues, extremely clearly. Thank you very much. Um, questions now. Can I just make a couple of points? I do want to emphasize that the LSE is deeply committed to the importance of freedom of speech, and we want everyone to feel they can put their point of view clearly but we are also committed to respecting each other and recognizing that while we might not agree, we should accept that people have the right to say it, but equally, if people are going to say things that seem extremely contentious, that they recognize that they need to be careful and respectful similarly in how they do it. So I'm sure this will be an entirely relaxed occasion, but I'm always asked to say that, so thank you for listening. 
Um, you have the hashtag up here. I should have mentioned that this is being videoed. It will be online um, as a podcast, we hope, fairly shortly. That, I believe, depends on the quality of the um, videoing, and I'm sure it's in extremely safe hands. Um, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure there. Um, and that's all I need to say. Would you please, in asking questions, um, say who you are and where you're from? Of course, if you don't want to, then you don't have to, but it's very helpful for us to know who's here and who's asking questions, um, just because we're interested, not because we want to follow it up in any way. Um, <laughs> so can we now move to questions and um, ask Sophie to take as many as she can? Yes. Um, lady at the back there and lady over, somebody over here with purple. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Jacqueline and I've lived in London for most of my life. Um, you made some very interesting points about your policies, but one of the things that really, that I think is really important is that the, the reason women aren't equal in, in this society, it's a deeper cultural thing rather than a policy issue. So how do you think you can what sort of policies can you use or, you know, mm -hmm. to try and change that? Because it's something that's really ingrained it in. Is, yeah. It's buying our girls doors and not allowing them to play with cars and things like that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Should I answer that one first? Should we just take one more? Yeah. Actually, my, my question might go along with that. Is uh, I want to say one thing quickly. The name, please. Says, name oh, sorry. Name, my name's Lucy. I'm a student studying sociology education. I've lived in London for 20-odd years. Um, I want to say quickly about the 1% of men who take paternity leave. That's 1% of... I heard it was 1% of all men, and I was quite disheartened, but it is 1% of all men, so that meant it's a high proportion of the eligible men, which was a little bit heartening, because, it, again, it's that thing about it's a movement in the right direction. So I thought that was nice. But my question was... Um, you mentioned City Hall is going to do sex and relationship education throughout all schools. At the moment, I know the Tories are completely three-line whipped, anti-sex education, compulsory. Uh, and I'm, personally, I'm for it. But then I think if, if the academies come in, how is that going to work? But I think as well it's a good thing. Is, to me, sex and relationship education is a good way of educating everybody, boys as well, mm -hmm. about equality, about female issues. And that's mm -hmm. one of the areas you could be addressing... The, the cultural ingrained idea that women are less than men or mm. whatever. Mm. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Jacqueline, yes, it's absolutely ingrained and uh, that is why uh, we set up a whole political party <laughs> to concentrate on this. Um, and I think that our approach um, is to say that we need, uh, we need to restructure and we need to restructure all the way along, all the way through every approach. And that's why we set the six objectives that we set, um, which, are, which include equal education, equal parenting, equal pay, equal representation in business and in working life, equality in the media, and an end to violence against women. Because we think that this is, this is not something that you can do in bits. And that's why it's taken us so long to get so very, very, very far, very, very short distance. Um, because the other political parties come at this precisely like, like that, like a detail. So they will sort of surface and occasionally say, oh, somebody's, uh, somebody, somebody says something about equal pay, or oh, we'll tweak this bit over here, and then go back down into whatever they were doing before. And then, you know, occasionally they'll hear something else about uh, so discrimination. Okay, well, tweak that valve over there. And, and what we're saying is that um, it's all got to happen, all at the same time, all together. The, 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 the question of uh, how our culture views women is so closely tied to women's capacity to earn. It's so closely tied to women, the way that women are portrayed in the media. It's so closely tied to women's voices in Parliament. Men outnumber women uh, two to one. It's so closely tied to the paucity of women in leadership positions in business, but also the occupational segregation that means that you know, little girls are being told that they shouldn't be doing this or they shouldn't want to do that or that actually they need to do this. We did some really interesting work with the Young Women's Trust who have ambassadors uh, working, speaking to young women in, in job centres because that's where that pay gap starts right there. You know, they arrive looking for a job and they are young women are steered into lower paid 
childcare often jobs, and young men are steered into construction work, which is immediately better paid, and, and then and we're off. And so, it, yeah, it, I think it's all so interlinked that the only way that we can tackle this is to do all of it together as a, as a, as a, a, a connected piece of work. It's not about, you know, it's not a clause here. It's not a tinkering with a piece of legislation there. We are so far beyond that. Um, I was telling somebody else the other story the, the, my, the other day. My daughter, I've got a six-year-old daughter, and she's going through that phase where she's really worried about when I'm going to die. And she keeps saying, but when are you going to die, Mommy? When, how old are you again? When are you going to die? Um, and, uh, and obviously I'm doing this every day, and I'm keenly aware of all the research that says how long it's going to take before we close the gender gap. Um, and the World Economic Forum had estimated it was going to take so long that I actually turned around to her and said, I'm going to be here till I'm at least 162. <laughs> um, the Sex and Relationships Education, Lucy. Um, it's a policy of the Women's Equality Party. It's a UK-wide policy. Um, we think it's absolutely vital. Um, and we have introduced it into our London mayoral uh, uh, policy document because as mayor of London, you've got a huge amount of sway. You can decide what you want to make priorities. We've seen the previous mayor has taken on various aspects of education. I think uh, that it would be entirely fitting for the next mayor of London to decide that this is a priority in London schools that London schools should lead the way. We are, it is a cruelty to our young people, frankly, not to give them this level of support. It really is. Um, and the 1%, I think it's a terrible shame. I find it hard to be optimistic and positive about that 1%. But I think it's very difficult for men, and I think you know, what we don't want to do is to say, oh, they're hopeless, why aren't men doing what? What we've got to do, in much the same way I was saying earlier, is we have to look at all the reasons that men don't feel able to take paternity leave. And that means changing workplace cultures where men feel uncomfortable about asking. It means doing something about pay levels. You know, when you're in a, you know, if you are in a family where the, 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 the man is the breadwinner, then you know, it doesn't make sense. It's very difficult. It's a, it's a luxury for some, really, to even contemplate taking that time off. Um, so that's why I think stuff like flexible working is so important, because we need to be able to give men and women the opportunity to balance lives, families, work, and to do it in partnership um, and, to, and, to, and I also think that actually, you know, what's been fascinating about this mayoral campaign has been talking to businesses in London, talking to young people, young people particularly in business, in tech businesses, who um, they don't want to work in old-fashioned patterns. They don't want to work from 7 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night in an office or on a board with 10 other white men. They don't want to do it. They want to work flexibly and imaginatively from different places at different times. And young men in particular are joining this party because they want to be, uh, they want to be parents that see their children. Um, and so actually I think there's a real challenge to business here because they are going to start losing talent. They are really going to start losing talent if they don't take this on board. Right, thank you. Next few questions. Sorry, I can't see people over here. Any, any more questions? Right, person in the middle there. Yep. Um, there, towards the end, and <coughs> someone over there with wonderful red hair. Hi, Sophie. Thank you very much for your talk. Loved hearing you speak again. And you know, I'm a, obviously now by now you know I'm a big fan, and I'm right behind you. And I'll be voting next Thursday. Um, I have so many questions, but I'll try and limit them to one or two. You've got time, don't worry. <laughs> um, to begin with, I wanted to ask you, you know, what is, um, what, what are your plans, what's next for the party? In terms of, yes, next week we're going to vote for you here in London, but what, what about after that? What are you guys planning to do in, in terms of a wider scale and a bigger scale? That's what I'd love to know. And um, my other question, which I actually forgotten now. It's on the floor. <laughs> Thank you. 
was um, once again, I think uh, what you're talking about, you know, cross-party um, um, collaboration is fantastic. And I'm, I'm once again going to bring up the youth in, in the city and what, what your plans are in terms of that, if you've had any further thoughts around that. And um, maybe the last question I'll, say, I'll just say about starting the branch, because I really want to do that, and I want to know how <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> so. Sure, well, thank you. Yes. Sophia. Thank you very much. Sorry, for I'm very sorry. Name, names, please. Sorry. Your name and. My name's Jeanette you're from, from Putney. Fine, thank you, Jeanette. Um, the dreaded Putney with the wonderful High Street. We have, I don't know, um, the, the present mayor seems to have done absolutely nothing about the air quality in London. And I'm wondering if you could help us and tell us what you intend to do when you become mayor. Sure. Do you know, my first thought when you said Putney was air quality, it's a bit hard on Putney, but it's certainly true. I'm Teresa, I'm an artist and I live in London. Uh, I've been fighting for many of the things that you've been saying since I was 18 and I'm now a very old bird. However, I just wanted to say one or two things. What I began to notice when I went to the endless meetings that all of us have to go to, if there's five women and seven men, whatever you say, even if they agree with you, nothing happens. The answer is you've got to be at these things shouting as loud as you can. Uh, and it does work. Many years ago I became a local councillor, which I assure you was most interesting. I recommend it. But when I went in, three of my friends said, oh, if Teresa can do it, so can I. But the thing that worries me at the moment is you haven't got a chance of getting things done unless there are equal numbers, and I am working as far as I can at my age for equal women in Parliament at the next election, 50-50. I don't care what party you are, um, monster raving loony if you want to, as long as there are equal numbers of women. Now a lot of these beautiful young women I see around here Get your mums, who are probably sort of middle-aged, 40s, 50s, get them to stand. And it needs encouragement. Forget about the rows we have with our mothers. Get them to stand. If they won't stand for Parliament, try the local authority. It's only when we have equality in Parliament that we are going to get other things done. And I wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, so many brilliant questions. Um, what's next for the party? So, um, when we sweep the board next week, <laughs> um, we have, we find ourselves in the curious position of being nine months old and fighting our first election. Uh, I mean, we're about a year old, but we opened for membership about nine months ago. Um, and the pace of the party since we first came up with the idea has been incredible. Um, we, have, we only do things fast, <laughs> uh, as these exhausted people in the front row will tell you. Um, so I think what we will do is we will um, we'll take a breather and we will go back to you. We will go back to our members um, and we will uh, talk about uh, what, what you want to see next. We are totally led by our membership. We are grassroots. Uh, you, the members, wrote our policies. Uh, we are aiming to have our first uh, annual conference in the autumn. So that will be an opportunity to uh, do a lot of thinking and a lot of strategizing together. Um, we will be doing a huge amount of fundraising for that conference. So if you know anybody who wants to help us host a conference around about October time, <laughs> let us know. Um, but really, the next bit, is, the next bit is, is learning from this experience, from learning from the first uh, election, uh, and putting that into a strategy for 2020, and consulting our members on, on, on how you want to develop the party to do that. Um, in terms of uh, helping youth uh, be part of politics? This is a really, really good question. This is such a good question because um, this is another thing that I've really noticed in, in, in participating in this mayoral campaign um, is how little actually there is 
um, across the, 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 the general uh, conversation in London about what it means to be young in London and what it means to live in London as a young person, what that feels like. Um, and that, you know, that spans a whole range of stuff that I think we should be doing better from, for example, um, you know, there's a piece on SRE that I, we, I really want to do. I, I think we need to be um, looking within the conversation on housing at uh, building communities where young people can thrive. So it's not just about building houses, it's about having youth centres, it's about having spaces for young people. Um, and also I think there's a, there's a lot about um, uh, services supporting young people uh, to, to, to thrive and flourish. Um, one of the, a lot of the work I do with uh, the um, autism support group that I run, um, I set up a, so I came to politics when my daughter was diagnosed with autism and I was really shocked by how poor the understanding and support services were, uh, particularly for uh, girls with autism and parents of girls with autism because we have this idea that autism only happens in boys and they all look like rain man and they all behave in that way and they're all really good at maths. Um, and, and so that to me was the moment where I also saw um, how bad, for example, uh, things like uh, children and young adults mental health services in London are, how they are really uh, struggling and underfunded, how long the waiting lists are. And I, I think there's a huge amount of work we need to do um, to, to help young people in London feel part of the city Part of, um, uh, part of life, part of, part of how they can, part, partly that they can change stuff, that they can participate. And that is about creating uh, policies that speak to them and are written by them and for them. And that's what we're also trying to do in the Women's Equality Party. So we have a very strong youth uh, uh, membership, a very strong youth branch. Our youngest members, we take membership from 14. Um, and um, we've been doing, um, it's been great to see how energised uh, young women and young men have been by having that possibility to come in and talk about doing things differently. Um, the last question on starting a branch, um, if anybody wants to start a branch, uh, please get in touch with our, uh, our, our central office. Um, the contact details are on our website. Um, we have uh, brilliant uh, members of staff who will uh, either tell you where your nearest local branch is and connect you to the, all the uh, activities that are happening there or if you're in an area where um, you uh, don't have a local branch and you'd like to set one up we will talk you through the process and help you organize that with a group of people around you to, to help you share that because one of the things we find out very very quickly is that once you set up a local branch you will find yourself very very busy. <laughs> um, air quality, yes this is uh, well, this is what we're trying to do with our transport plan. We're trying to come at this differently. Um, what I find interesting in all the conversations we have about transport in London is that we, we talk about building more and more and more and more infrastructure. Um, it's about making it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and, and I understand that that's got to happen, particularly in, in, in areas of South, Lon South London where you know, the transport system, the networks aren't there. But I think, weirdly, we've moved away from actually having a conversation about making what we do have work better so that people can actually use it. Which is why I was making that, comp having, so I started my speech about talking about how difficult it is to actually physically get on a bus. If we want to deal with air pollution in London, we have got to give people alternatives to cars. And it's very easy to demonize people who use cars, but a lot of the people who use cars are families and, pe and people with disabilities. Because it's really, really hard to use buses and it's really, really hard to access the tube network. And I think there's some really basic work we need to do there. Um, in terms of Heathrow, I, I'm, I, we're not going to get anywhere with Heathrow. I'm, I'm not, I'm not pro-Heathrow at all. Um, and I, and I, but I also think the, the, the opportunity to design a better bus, and I'm serious about it. I mean, it sounds like a very easy, oh, let's just have a better bus. <laughs> but I really do think that the, op the opportunity is there to design a better bus and a greener bus uh, so that we are getting people out of cars and, and dealing with the emissions problem for the vehicles that we are building and using. Um, and similarly with cycling, we know um, there's all this work gone into building cycle <coughs> highways, but we're not actually creating communities in London where people can cycle. So we need to be making it possible for people to cycle in their local areas as well. We need to be looking at, at, at building there too. 
um, and we need to be encouraging women and children. I'd love to be able to poodle around uh, uh, Barnet on my bike. Not, I would never do it in a million years. The, you know, I, I, don't, I don't feel safe. I don't want to take my daughters with me. Um, and I'd, but I'd love to be able to do that. So I think we need to look at uh, how we encourage women and families to, to cycle around London too. Um, uh, I don't know how to follow that. That was fantastic. Um, I think you're absolutely right. We do need to get more women into politics. Yes. Excuse me for a moment. Carry on. which is uh, to, uh, to do something about the representation of women. Nice to see you. So, yeah, job done. <laughs> um. So there's, a, there's two things here. I'm just going to answer a question. So, um, uh, I'll call it down the hallway. Um, we... There's two things about this. One is, yes, absolutely, we need to have 50-50 women and we need to be doing, I think we can do some very basic work in terms of using quotas to uh, solve this problem. Um, uh, again, it's one of those things that people sort of scratch their heads about. Oh, how are we going to do this? It's really hard. It's really not hard. We can do it in 10 years um, if we introduce a quota system. But there's a, there's a deeper piece of work we need to do too, which is something that we are doing at the Women's Equality Party, which is uh, giving women the confidence to do politics, to come into campaigning, to join a political party, to raise their heads above the parapet, to say, you know, actually, I do have a voice and I want to use it and I want to, to do this differently. Some of those things are very practical issues. Um, I'm really suddenly realised I can't see anybody over there. Sorry, I've been speaking behind a lectern. Um, some of those things are very practical issues um, because actually it's expensive to do politics. And, and that's the reason why fewer women do it. Um, you have to, 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 to campaign, you have to have funds. You have to be able to walk away from a job for a period of time and canvas and, and talk to people and, uh, and, and pursue that really punishing schedule of campaigning. Um, and, so there's some, and that's why we took the very practical measures that we did in terms of offering um, uh, support to candidates on low incomes and, and childcare support. You know, that's another reason that women don't, don't do politics or are reluctant to do politics because everything so often comes back to childcare. We, um, so we offered childcare support and, you know, nobody's ever done that before. It blows my mind that nobody has ever done that before, that no political party has offered childcare support. We're having a conversation with um, so the Electoral Commission we were talking to about it in terms of, you know, does this come under the, the bracket of um, uh, campaign expenses? They were like, don't know. <laughs> no one's ever done it before. That, that to me is incredible. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of work to do. And, 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 a lot, and a lot of it is actually very straightforward. It's just that no one's thought of doing it before. Good. Sophie, thank you very much. You one there, yes. Sorry, I'm conscious this lectern is completely blocking us. Can I, may I just, if you'd like to go first, and then one, two, three on this side as well, please. Let's get as many in as we can. Okay. Sophie, do you want to come over here? To yeah, shall I stand up? So that... Hello! <laughs> Terribly sorry, I hadn't realised the extent to which this was blocking us out. Hi, my name's Lauren. Um, I thought it was interesting how you described yourself as a non-partisan party. Um, and I think especially from a PR point of view, that's a really great idea. But it seems like a lot of the issues that you kind of want to implement, so especially the provision and the extension of affordable childcare, seem far more ideologically aligned with the left. And so what I was wondering is how far do you believe it's really possible to be a non-partisan party and also to be a party of intersectional, fe intersectional feminism? Or do you think that you know, an intersectionally feminist party will always have more in common with the policies of the left? Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Anna. Uh, and I'm f I've lived in London for two years, but I'm originally from Denmark. And uh, thank you for the speech. It was really interesting and uh, uh, yeah, it gave me a lot to think about. Um, 
But I was wondering, because we don't have a woman equality party in Denmark, and I haven't seen it many places in Europe, actually. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering why you've started uh, a woman equality party here in UK. Is that because um, it's more necessary here in the UK, or is it because uh, EU feminist other places are more lazy? <laughs> <laughs> And that, that brings me to my second question, which is um, if we go a bit broader and we think about EU and the Brexit and everything that's coming next, um, where do you stand uh, regarding the European social project sure. and, uh, and the Brexit? Sure. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, non-partisan. Yeah, it foxes everyone this. Um, and it's an experiment. You know, it's completely an experiment. Um, however, I completely reject the idea that equality for women is a left, is, a, is, a, is an idea of the left. Totally reject it. Um, and I think what's really interesting about this party is that we are amplifying the voices of people in all of the other parties to uh, get this to the top of their agendas too. We know that, that there are women in, in all of the other parties who are saying to us very discreetly, keep going, because now we have to have that conversation here. And, and that's, that's a really important part of our work. Um, uh, in terms of uh, intersectional feminism, I wasn't quite sure what your question was, except yes, uh, we are. Um, we, are we are completely uh, uh, grassroots, grown from the bottom up. We are running a, a, a list of uh, people, a list of women for the GLA. That list is 30% LGBT+, 30% BME. It's, it's, it's fully representative of our membership, um, and I think we're bringing a far more uh, uh, accurate representation of, of what women look like uh, in, in all their uh, forms into politics. Um, and could we plan to continue? Uh, that way, along that route. Um, why did we start a wee party? Uh, shall, I go and, uh, well, okay, shall I go and get my speech? <laughs> um, I mean, we, you know, we, started, we started the party because we were sick of waiting. I was really sick of waiting. Um, and, and so was everybody else who, who, who came to join us. I was, and it was very, very frustrating to me because I... Um, I really wanted to use my vote. The last general election, I really wanted to use my vote and I wanted to vote for somebody who would understand my experience, who would offer to me solutions for the problems that I, I needed help solving. I wanted somebody who was going to see and understand and act on how expensive my childcare was, on the fact that so many of my friends were paying for that childcare out of salaries that are lower than those of the men in their workplaces. I wanted somebody, having been through uh, the experience of, of, of my daughter's diagnosis, of the struggle to get the services and the support that we needed, I wanted somebody who would understand what her life was going to be like as a, as a, as a young woman doubly discriminated against now because of a disability. I wanted someone who was going to uh, uh, build an education system that saw, reacted, responded to the sparkle that was slowly dying in my little girl who bounced into school at the age of four saying, I'm going to be an astronaut and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and came out only very few weeks later saying, the boys say, I can't do this and I can't do that and I shouldn't wear this. And I, can't. and I didn't see any of that. I didn't see any of it in any of the other parties' policies. I didn't see any of it. And worse, I saw a nearly version of it at the back of their manifestos. Like I was a special interest. Pigeon fanciers and women. Let's do a couple of lines for them. And I thought, I am sick of this. I am really sick of this. I am sick of having my vote taken for granted. I am sick of voting and being told to wait in line. So that is why 
I help build this party. And it is what propels me out of bed every morning <laughs> because I think it's time. Um, I think you have to go and ask all the other EU countries why they've not, <laughs> not started their own. But we are open sourcing everything we do. And we are very happy to talk to anybody. If you want to have a coffee at some point about starting one over there, very happy to do that. Um, as far as um, Brexit goes, um, we don't have a party line on Brexit. Um, uh, we don't take a party line outside of the areas that are uh, specified among our six objectives. Um, I think it's a great shame that the debate around Brexit has gone so quickly into such an old-fashioned, uh, 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 aggressively masculine argument. Um, I think it's putting huge numbers of people off. Um, we know already that, that it's putting women off. Um, we need to have a gendered version of this argument that looks at what the impact of Brexit will be on women. You know, women make the economic decisions in their households. They want to know the impact a Brexit will have on the cost of living and on the cost of transport and on the cost of childcare if they're relying on cheap foreign labour for childcare, because many are. Um, I think we need a better and more sophisticated take on what this means. In the short term, I worry that uh, the uncertainty that a Brexit would cause would, as ever, have a bigger impact on women because we see that whenever there is economic uncertainty, as I referred to in the speech, um, you know, we invest in infrastructure, we cut back public services, and I don't, you know, I don't want that to happen. I personally am, am pro-Europe. Um, I think that, uh, and this is my personal stance, um, I think that uh, Europe has, has, has brought us uh, many benefits, has brought many benefits for women um, uh, from Article 119 and the Equal Pay uh, legislation that followed that forced the UK as a member of the EU to create and expand its own uh, Equal Pay legislation. Um, and I understand the worries that some people have about the entrepreneurial nature of the European Commission, but actually it's that, it's that entrepreneurial nature that forced through um, uh, maternity leave as part of a, you know, it, they couldn't get it through as a, as a social security work, piece of work, so they buried it <laughs> um, in a piece of work on, on health and safety at work. And so, you know, against reluctant member states, and so, you know, this is what has given us, give, give many, many women um, maternity rights, uh, protected uh, 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 pregnant workers. Um, the EU's done, you know, Europe has brought us also uh, anti-discrimination work. Um, it's enshrined the importance of ending violence against women. Uh, I think there is much more work that needs to be done, much more work that needs to be done, uh, but I think it's made a good start. Questions here. No, that's fine. Two more. Hello, uh, my name is Fernanda. I lived in London for now for 10 years, but I am originally from Brazil. I joined the party a few weeks after it was launched, I think, for the same reason as you. I was sick of it, hmm. just waiting for equality. And also, like, by my own experience of being out of work because of high cost of childcare. Hmm. Um, in terms of your membership, you, you're saying that you know, the party has now 47,000 members. I'm just curious about how, what's the proportion of men? Mm -hmm. Because I think that one of um, the things that it's important for equality, women's equality, is mm -hmm. to have men on board. Mm -hmm. I think unless they are with us on this, it's going to take even longer. Um, and in terms of... Um, um, flexible work. I think it's very important that we stress that's flexible work for women and for men. Oh, yes. More and yes. more now. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we hear we from parents, yeah, that, you know, fathers are so, as you said in your speech, that you, you, they're taking out of their families because they want to spend more time, but they feel that if they, they challenge the status quo, they, they are seen as not very well committed to their jobs. So, yeah. So it's basically childcare and uh, membership for men. Sure. Okay. Thank you.
question at the back, right at the back there. Somebody, is there anybody else over there? Hi, this is Kate from London. I've grew up, grown up in London my whole life. I was wondering, so I support many of your policies, but not the quotas. Do you have any evidence that could sway me into believing that this is a good idea to change the, the culture around views of women? Sure. Should I do those two now? <coughs> okay, so um, we don't, I, don't, I can't give you a number on men, um, but we are really heartened by the number of men who are joining. Um, there are a uh, lot of men in business who are joining, there are a lot of men um, uh, who are frustrated um, by the slowness in business to get more women into senior leadership positions and want to support us to help do that. Um, there are lots of uh, young men, as I was saying earlier, who are joining because they are uh, frustrated by what's on offer in terms of um, workplace culture, workplace uh, 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 working patterns. Um, there are lots of men who are joining who are having uh, daughters and suddenly think, think oh, oh. Uh, we had one young man who joined um, after uh, an experience on Tinder who joined and said oh my god it's awful on there for women isn't it please can I join the women's equality party um, so yeah there are lots of men joining there are lots of men joining um, you know we're not doing special male outreach work we don't need to equality for women is not a women's issue it's a matter for everyone um, and you know as we grow and, and, and our presence is, is grows on the political scene more and more people are seeing that and are coming coming to join us and yes the childcare and the flexible working again as we were talking about earlier it's as long as women care and men work care will never be valued it's absolutely got to be something that men and women do together and that's at the heart of all of our policies quotas I love this one. Um, this was uh, a, a decision that was taken by a membership. We went out there with our objective about equal representation in business and the workplace. How do you want to do this? And the answer came back really loudly. I think it was like, you know, eight out of ten members said, you know what? Quotas. Tired of waiting, tired of being told, you know, we can do 25%. Okay, if we can just about get 25%, that's great. Look, that's progress. Hooray. Now we can try for 30%. Really? Can't we be a bit more ambitious? Do we have to be happy with 25%? Do we have, why do we have to be told that 25% is the best we can do? Why do we have to buy the argument that quotas introduce mediocrity? If by that argument, the only people who are any good at anything are white middle class men. If that's really the argument, then we're saying that, that women, that black people, that disabled people can't do anything because they're not on boards and they're not running businesses. And we're also not talking about the quotas that have existed for hundreds of years. All those unspoken, unlegislated for quotas, for men, by men. What we're talking about is a short-term, totally transparent process to offer women with the equal skills and the equal talents to go in and do these jobs. There is a huge amount of disinformation around quotas. There is a huge amount of disinformation by a small but very vocal group of anti-quota people. And, and now there is this weird idea that quotas means like grabbing the first woman who walks past in the street. We need someone for the board. I'll see who's at the bus stop. That is not how it works. And we are doing brilliant talented women a huge disservice by continuing this crazy argument that quotas somehow means that they are mediocre and our membership is fully in agreement. Um, two people here in the centre. I think there's a lady over here as well as being right. tried. We've got three men who are about to join the fun. <laughs> yes, sure. Of Hi, my name's Andy. Um, my question was more related to your experience with autism. Mm. Um, I was just wondering what you think the main issues are for women and girls with autism disorders compared to um, men and boys. 
Sure. Good question. The gentleman just, just behind there. You Hi, my name's uh, Mohammed. I'm a uh, professional working in health technology. My question is really more for, for Kate Jenkins. Uh, looking at the, at the wall of the strip of the grit, grit and the good behind you, the men outnumber women by almost two to one. Uh, I'm just wondering whether you had, in general, uh, a, a policy or a view in terms of 50-50 external speakers, and if that's maybe something that the Women's Equality Party could also promote. I think we could probably get our heads around that one, yeah. I think we can. Can I say that this is something which is a very live issue, and it has got a great deal better over the years as a result of some fairly determined um, pressure, um, and I think we're getting near it. There is certainly a great consciousness here. I mean, this, this evening has been um, hosted by the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion group within the school who are working at it. Um, but the 50-50 idea seems to me unarguable, really is. Um, and well, there's chair, I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, um, this issue is, I think, is live in many places and we have to recognise that that's the case. Joy, please do. Just to add to that, the um, school formally has a policy of aiming towards 40% minimum um, for either gender in the public events program. We do report on that annually, but one of the challenges we have is getting information from speakers, not only on gender, um, but also on a range of measures such as ethnicity, disability, and so on. We're actually looking at that within the EDI task force at the moment. Um, I noticed the images as well. Um, and we are conscious that there's a there's a big issue for the school about representation and about what you see when you come to events here, um, how we look as an institution. There's a big web improvement program going on at the moment and that issue of representation of imagery of the school is really important as part of that. Um, it is a live issue as, as Kate Jenkins says. Thank you very much, Joy. Good question. Good question. To do um, with the, the two uh, So, uh, yes, I'll just answer the... Um, this is a fascinating thing, area for me, uh, responding to the needs of women and girls who are diagnosed with autism. Um, and I think the main thing I have to say is that we don't know enough about what it's like to be a woman and a young girl with autism. Because the diagnostic template is male. We base our diagnosis of autism on what autism looks like in men and young boys. And women do not present the same way. Young girls with autism do not present the same way. Not least because it's a spectrum condition, so everybody has sort of a different version of it anyway. But there is a real crisis, I think, in, in, in what's happening to young girls and women with autism who are not being diagnosed and who are not having their needs recognized. Um, there is a huge mental health crisis happening there um, and I think uh, you know it's, 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 it's a very difficult thing to be a teenage girl it's a really difficult thing to be a teenage girl with autism uh, because there is that additional social pressure to behave in a certain way there is something intrinsically viewed as intrinsically male about the most autistic aspects of, of, of men with autism in a way that is that is almost accepted. You can be blunt, you can see things black and white, you can, uh, you can do, do lots of numbers, lots of sums, and be slightly difficult and a bit prickly, and it's like, you know, that's okay, right? But if you're a woman and you behave that way, it is really not okay. Although, conversely, if you're a woman and you behave like that, you do actually fit the mold of autism and you might get a diagnosis. Um, so, but there is a real problem. There are, you know, I, I, I have many, many friends who have, who have girls on the spectrum. I know many stories. I am an ambassador for the National Autistic Society. And I hear time and time and time again about girls who are crushed by this weight of social expectation, who do not understand uh, the jokes, can't follow jokes, can't follow social communication patterns, can't read faces, and mask it, are constantly masking it, are constantly behaving in the way that they think girls should behave because they don't feel able, they don't understand what's going on, they don't have a diagnosis, and they don't feel able to say, I don't get it, I don't want to be like this, I don't want to behave like that, I don't, you know. So it's, I think, you know, I have no idea how hard it is to be a boy and a man with autism, but I see how very, very difficult it can be for women and girls with autism. Um, 
Yeah, sure. In your manifesto, you say you want to encourage more women and girls to go into science, technology, mm. engineering, and maths, and so on. Mm. You say there's a dearth of women who run museums and galleries. You do seem to be talking mainly about university graduates. I'm wondering why you don't say more about the so-called manual trades. Mm -hmm. I mean, why can't we have more female plumbers and electricians? Totally agree. And yep. uh, do, you, do you actually have members who work, you know, who are electricians, plumbers, or interior decorators? And do, you, do, you, do you have political links with the group called uh, Women and Manual Trades? which I think started in 1975, mm. WAMT. Uh, what can you do in a practical way to uh, bring about more, and not just individuals, but teams and yes. businesses yes. Uh, working in the construction industry, but yep. not necessarily at a powerful level, but at a, more, at a lower status? Sure. Thank you. Um, there's a lady over there who's been very patient. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Fiona. I'm a uh, GP trainee in North West London. And um, just because it's uh, quite appropriate today, because we're obviously, I'm a junior doctor and I'm striking, um, I just wondered obviously, medicine is one of the. <laughs> is actually one of the professions that I think um, now women's um, admission to medical schools actually surpass men, um, which is brilliant, but um, junior doctors in the new contract will be, um, women will be disproportionately um, negatively affected by the new contract um, because they generally work part-time. Um, and I just wondered, you know, generally um, what the Women's Quality Party stance was on, mm -hmm. on it and whether you'd be um, you know, willing to put pressure on Jeremy Hunt and the government from that kind of point of view because obviously healthcare and the NHS is a very important issue for the whole country and particularly um, the half that is women and, and also children. Yes. So. Um, well, I was at the vigil last night um, and uh, have we, have we've, uh, the party is fully... Uh, behind you um, and has spoken out about uh, the huge injustice of this contract and the particular injustice um, that it implies for women. Um, we think there should be a fair and equal contract. I think uh, I was appalled to read the equalities assessment of that contract um, and um, we have uh, issued statements and been down to support the doctors who are uh, out last night in the freezing cold, which was, I was full of admiration. Um, I, um, it's, a, it's a United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, Equality for Women, um, and it's one that David Cameron has signed up to. Um, and so I think it's indefensible that his government is writing contracts that directly contravene uh, that. Um, Yes, I'd like lots of women plumbers and lots of women engineers and lots of women who feel that they can do whatever they want. Um, uh, we have got very specific policies in our London Manifesto that look at 50-50 uh, apprenticeships right across the board. So not just STEM, but also um, you know, uh, getting young girls into construction and engineering and opportunities that they, might, that they are currently being told are not for them. Um, and we are building relationships with um, uh, bodies like women in construction and um, uh, women in transport who I met recently um, and that's absolutely work that we will continue to do and to grow um, after the election along with the wider piece of work we were talking about earlier so um, if you've got an, intro an introduction for me in women in manual trades, that'd be lovely. Thank you. I'll see you after the year, <laughs> after the meeting. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Sophie, any more time or shall we? I think we're, we don't think we're just about done. We've got to, oh, another question up there. Any more last round of questions? People who haven't asked a question already, all appearing. Um, somebody right at the back, somebody there. We've got three last ones, haven't we? Jessie's itching to ask him a question. She doesn't know if she gets it. Little girl, yes. 
Uh, hi, I'm Luke. I, <coughs> I work on a programme trying to increase the diversity in the legal profession. Uh, one of I'm the sorry, a diversity in the legal, legal profession. Legal. Uh, one of the key things that we're seeing is that those in power, they simply, there's no will to change, mainly because they'll lose a bit of their privilege, a bit of their power. Um, what do you want to do to try and make them change and what do you, how do you want to hold accountable those that refuse, particularly in terms of uh, recruitment, retention and promotion? Oh, you'll see the big ones still the last. Okay. Hello, I'm Ruth. I'm a strategist at an advertising agency. Um, I wanted to ask you about how you create a culture of leadership, um, particularly for younger women who um, may not have been uh, given the role models to step into, for example, senior management, um, mm -hmm. and how that can become um, part of the day-to-day. Um, and that confidence to be able to speak up and to demand to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, how do we make that normal? Good, thank you. Could I just say there are a couple more people who do, by all means, ask questions, but keep them really, quite, really short because we are running out of time. Thanks. One at the back there, yeah. Hi, Sophie. My name's uh, Roisin, and I work in the construction industry. Hey! Hello! You're all very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually see quite a lot of women that I work with with and they're all kind of my age and um, I saw an older woman turn up in the office and I was shocked because she was so rare and, and I've talked with other friends that work in finance and in mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. and older women, in the, I don't want to be 55 and disappear from mm. the workplace and I want to know what you think or what policies yes. you could make to yes, kind of keep question. older women yes. in the workplace. Yes, excellent question. Um, How do we hold those in power to account? We build new political parties from scratch and take them on. Um, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with the enormity of your question. Uh, you said it was, was this specifically in the legal profession or was this a, just a general sort of ensconced, entrenched? My question is question. My question Yes. It doesn't, doesn't work, yeah. Well, that's why we built the party. Vote for us and we'll do it. Uh, it you know, we've, got po we've written policies um, that very specifically lay out how we would put these quotas in place and how long we think we would need them for, which is a short period of time in order to make the adjustments we need. Uh, we've got very clear ideas about how we can work with businesses to encourage them uh, to embrace greater diversity. Uh, I mean, I think increasingly we're pushing on an open door there because there's barely a week goes by where there isn't another report that basically says it's bad business not to have a diverse workforce and you will actually make fewer profits. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, you know, we're using the political system. We built a new party to, to do things differently. So that's how we plan to do it. So vote for us and help us do it differently. Um, how do we introduce... Um, how do we... Uh, Culture of leadership for young women, Ruth's question. I think we need to listen. There is a huge amount of pressure put on women to behave in a certain way. Um, we say, we tell women that if you didn't get that job, it's because you haven't done enough training. And we tell women, if you didn't get that pay rise, it's because you didn't ask for it. We tell women, if you didn't get that promotion, it's because you're not speaking up and being heard. Um, I think we need to change workplace cultures so that we can hear people and see people who otherwise aren't heard and seen, rather than putting the onus on them to act differently. Um, I keep hearing, you know, women need to get a thicker skin. Mm, I hate that. You know, we need, we need people with thin skins who feel things and can be appreciated and given the space to lead differently and work differently and create differently alongside everybody you know it's about diversity it's about lots of different ways of, of working and leading uh, and I think we've got to break this mold that that leaders look a certain way and sound a certain way and stride around being loud um, you know I think we absolutely I want to see I, I want I want to I want to say to my daughter that she can do anything she wants and she doesn't have to change herself in order to do that and that's about making people creating a situation where we listen better um, uh, yeah, the invisibility of older women is, is, a, 
is, is a really important thing. Um, and it's one of the things that we, talk, we have talked a lot about in terms of building policies. Um, and it's uh, one of the reasons that um, we want to take uh, action on care. I think increasingly what's happening, we're seeing now, is that women who were pushed out of the workplace or kept out of the workplace by the duties of looking after children are now uh, finding it difficult to get in or having to leave again because they are now looking for, after their parents or their husband's parents. Um, but again, um, this is not something that is, that, 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 you know, to go back to what we were saying right at the very beginning, this isn't about, um, uh, oh, we do that thing over there and we, on, we do that valve over there. It's, you know, we will see and hear and, and appreciate older women when we see and hear and appreciate all women. And that starts in how we teach young, young girls and young boys and, and follows through to the jobs that they do and the family balance that they strike and the, their presence in business and in parliament and how they are portrayed in the media. I mean, it's a huge piece of work and we need to do all of it uh, all right the way through. Um, I'm uh, going to be 45 next month. Uh, so I've got 10 years. I do not plan on disappearing when I'm 55. <laughs> Thank you. Can we just give a voice to the youngest generation? Please. Hello. I'm Jessie and Jessie. I've lived in London um, for all of my life. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to say that um, in schools, some teachers can be sexist, and um, I'd like to know if you can change that. Uh, Jesse, I will do my very best. <laughs> it is one of the reasons that I decided I wanted to do this job. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's on my very long to-do list and it's uh, right at the top. I don't think it's... How old are you? I think that's very sad that you're 10 and you've had experience of sexist teachers and I think it's not acceptable. Um, and um, I would like you to come and help us figure out ways that we can stop that from happening. Thank you. Good. Right. Astounded silence after the ten-year-old's question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very Good. much. I've had a right. lovely time. It's been great. Thank you.